Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name's Steve Simpson. I'm a marine biologist. I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter, but also a fellow of the Cabot Institute here at the University of Bristol. I'm also uh, funded by my research council as a knowledge exchange fellow. That means that as well as conducting primary research in the marine environment, I also get to spend time with policymakers, politicians, uh, charities, NGOs, industry, to try and make sure that the research that we conduct is of most value to those that can make use of it, um, both for economic but also societal uh, values. But as um, you heard in my introduction, I'm also a surfer, I'm a scuba diver, I'm a fisherman, and I'm a father of two young children who are just learning to love the water. And like all of you here, I'm a resident of planet Earth. Now, of course, the first question that an alien would ask if they ever happened upon planet Earth is, why on Earth do we call it planet Earth? It's covered by ocean. 72% of it is covered by the ocean. 99.97% of the habitable area on the planet is water, and yet we call it planet Earth. And the ocean is critical for many different processes. It drives, it's a heat pump, it stores heat, um, and it's the movement of heat around the ocean that, co uh, that causes weather, that drives the climate, that causes the Indian monsoon once a year, that delivers water to half of the world's population. It's also um, uh, crucial for many of the big chemical cycles, um, for the water cycle. So it's obviously a very important um, uh, aspect of our planet. It's a very productive part of our planet. You've probably heard rainforests described as the lungs of the earth. Well, to be fair, the rainforest might be the right lung, the ocean is the left lung. Every other breath you take is oxygen that has been produced at sea through primary produ production. And it's a vast wealth of biodiversity. Recently, we conducted a census of marine life through, the, through, uh, through many organizations across the world. And about a quarter of a million species were listed as known to science from the marine environment. But the census also suggested that this was probably only about a sixth of the number of species in the oceans. So as a larder of, uh, of biodiversity, it's clearly important. But for humans, it's important in many other ways, both economically and societally. So we looked at the oceans as a source of energy. Historically, that's been from drilling uh, oil and gas. Um, and it's really been that oil and gas that has fueled the development of humanity in many ways. But increasingly, we're looking offshore for renewable energy too. The offshore wind farm in is, uh, uh, industry is growing at 20% per annum. And we're also thinking, and you'll be well aware of this from Bristol, about the opportunities perhaps that tidal energy could bring to us. The tidal barrage, I remember the, uh, talking about that in, in GCSE geography, you know, 20 years ago. And it's still something that we consider. There's a lot of energy out there. Whether we can harness it is something that we'll find out over the next probably 20 years. It's also our highway. 90% of world trade is transported at sea. It's our Food larder, so one in six people on the planet depend on fish as the primary source of protein in their diet. World fisheries, um, if you include aquaculture as well, provide jobs for about 8% of the world's population. And if you uh, look at uh, fish as a commodity, it's the most important food commodity, $108 billion a year as a commodity. So that's why the ocean's important to us, not to mention recreation, the fun that we can have in the ocean, the value that that has to coastal communities uh, through tourism. The Great Barrier Reef was valued at $5 billion to the Australians. But we don't live in this wonderful world where we can enjoy the ocean for everything it can bring to us. Increasingly, we're thinking about threats to the ocean. If when I studied marine biology 15 years ago, I was told that all that we would consider as marine biologists now is the threats to the ocean. I'm sure half of the class would have walked out, but I hope that I wouldn't have because I think it's a, still an opportunity. It's an it's a era of opportunity for, for us to get things right. Now, just to think about some of the threats, no doubt you've heard about uh, pollution. Chemical pollution used to be the thing in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we've done a lot of things to get that right. But increasingly, plastics pollution is something that is really making the headlines. 
plastic showing up in the stomachs of albatross, of whales, of seals, of, sea, of many seabirds. Um, and some of these plastics being plastics that are likely to be around um, because they just don't degrade for decades through to centuries. Overfishing is clearly an issue. About 32% of stocks around the world are considered overexploited, uh, um, uh, fully exploited on their way back from recovery. Um, only about 14% of stocks are considered to still have excess fish that we haven't yet started to harvest. So we're clearly fishing very hard. Whether we get that right is an interesting question. And as the population grows, obviously, um, at, at the moment, we've, we're on somewhere like 7 billion. We're expecting to get to 9 billion by 2050. So that would probably be enough people to fill this stage as well as uh, the rest of you here. Population is going to grow, and we're going to have to keep looking to the oceans for food. But it also means that uh, people live near to the coast. That you, you get something called coastal squeeze as cities on the coastline build further and further towards the water's edge, even reclaiming land. You see these incredible examples, particularly in the Middle East, of, of Palm Island resorts or of uh, uh, the, the world as an archipelago of artificial islands. And that's great, but it really brings us closer to the ocean and all of the force of the ocean. So naturally, you might have mangrove areas, you might have seagrass areas, you might have mud flats that are the buffer between land and the ocean. Without that, as soon as a hurricane or a cyclone comes in, tsunami particularly, there's no protection. So this is the state of the world at the moment. Now, The main figure here really highlights the issue that probably many, many marine biologists now spend their time thinking about and worrying about, and that's climate change. This is just a distribution of heat through the world, but you can see that, um, that there's a great variation in heat. What we're now seeing is that this red warm zone is starting to expand. And with that warming, we're seeing uh, sea level rise starting to occur. We're seeing um, the distribution of fish starting to be affected, the distribution of plankton starting to be affected. So we've got cod and haddock in the North Sea moving towards the pole, moving into deeper water, trying to find their preferred temperatures. We've got plankton blooms occurring at times that they didn't used to happen, which means that if fish spawn so that their larvae can take advantage of that plankton, there's a mismatch in terms of when the spawning happens and when the bloom happens. And that mismatch can mean a uh, tragedy for a population. Now, I think probably until about five years ago, the dominant threat from climate change was warming. That was the thing we all thought about. What is that going to mean for coral reefs? What is that going to mean for fish distributions, abundances, and so on? But climate change isn't just warming. Carbon dioxide from anthropogenic um, uh, uh, industry uh, makes, itself, makes its way into the ocean. About a half of all of the CO2 produced since the Industrial Revolution has been absorbed into the sea and has changed the chemistry of the ocean. And this is a process called um, ocean acidification. And so you see uh, examples of plankton communities that if you rear these plankton in the conditions we predict into the, into the coming century, they don't grow in the way that they were supposed to. If you put fish into those conditions, they don't behave in the way that they were supposed to. The challenges that ocean acidification might throw to marine environments is something that we're only just starting to uh, get at. So that's where we are. That's probably the state of the world at the moment in many ways. And the question is, is that something we're happy with? It's our watch. It's your generation, our generation, our children's generation. It's all of our watch. And is it Something that we're willing, as scientists, to chart, as general public, to read about in the newspapers, the demise of what was once a wonderful natural resource. Now, I think when we look to the future, we're actually in an exciting era, but one that we've got to make some serious decisions. We're probably at a crossroads where if we carry straight on and we go business as usual, it's going to be a pretty gloomy place to be. Predictions are, if you think about world fisheries, there could be a decline of fisheries through this coming century. Some estimates are that the big global fisheries will be gone by the year 2050. 
whether that's true or not, is up for debate. But the current traje trajectory is gloomy. We're seeing areas where rather than fish being the dominant um, uh, species, we're seeing things like jellyfish. Um, this is a, a figure from a science paper that talks about the slippery slope to slime. The idea that if we remove top-end predators, we start to then fish the piscivores, we then go for the herbivores, and eventually we're picking out some of the invertebrates that are left until we've got a very depauperate ecosystem, one that doesn't have a resilience to be able to tackle uh, uh, future challenges that come with climate change. It's thought that a two degree centigrade rise could bring about um, uh, the end of coral reefs as we know them. We're seeing coral bleaching much more regularly. And that bleaching is something that the corals just can't uh, 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 tolerate year after year after year. So the question is, what can we do? And I think really we've got two opportunities at this crossroad. We can either take a left turn and think about moving back to a more natural system, using nature to try and provide some of the remedy. So this could mean things like um, uh, allowing fish stocks to recover. Now that could be expensive to the fishing industry. It could mean gear restrictions. It could mean moratoria on certain fish stocks, allowing that population to grow back again. Now there are real benefits in doing that because as, as a fishing industry, if you want to catch sustainably, you can draw on the interest of that natural capital. And if we let that capital grow back again, we can draw more interest. And that's something the European Union is starting to think about quite carefully. We can obviously decrease carbon dioxide emissions, both through alternative energy sources and also through efficiency. And I think that's something that industry are really taking on board. It was fantastic to hear about the air industry in that sense. The shipping industry, um, one that I'm familiar with, um, recently um, uh, changed the way they consider what is a good practice in terms of the environment to a system where the top 10% in terms of their environmental credentials get to decide what good practice is. And the other 90% have to follow suit. So it's not a consortium decision between the whole industry. And that really pushes towards good practice. Maersk, one of the shipping companies, you've probably seen their big blue shipping containers around the place, have, said that, have pledged to try and reduce their fuel use by 40% in the next five years. That's not with alternative fuels. That's not with alternative ships. That's just by choosing the speed at which the ships move, the efficiency in terms of what they're carrying and where they're carrying it. The European Union, as I mentioned, are thinking about fishing for maximum sustainable yield. And one of the ways that stocks can be allowed to recover, which is something the UK are really thinking about carefully, is the use of marine protected areas. You'll probably see a lot about that in the news over the next year because the UK is about to start announcing where marine protected areas are going to be placed. The idea of a marine protected area is that it allows the spawning stock of a fish species to build up. You get a, a, a large spawning stock that not only seeds itself, brings back more fish into that marine protected area, which is great for conservation, but it also seeds the fished areas. So it, provi it effectively provides, replenishes areas that will be fished. And we're even talking about marine quiet zones. So all of this offshore industry has increased the levels of noise in the ocean by 30 times over the last century. So the ocean is a noisy, noisy place. But the idea that noise is a great pollutant because you can turn it off. It would take about a day to turn the oceans back to their natural pre-noisy, pre-industrial state. But you can turn it off like that. And so the idea is that you could have marine quiet zones, areas where ships perhaps avoid during spawning times or offshore construction of wind farms only occurs in certain seasons. If you know there's a migration of whales coming through, you can control the noise that's being produced in that area. So that's our take a left turn and go for something more natural. The alternative, and certainly the Bush administration was very keen on this, and I'm not necessarily saying that all of this is wrong, um, is to use technology to try and solve our situation. We engineered our way into this problem. We can engineer our way back out of it. It's certainly a more attractive idea to economists, to industrialists, and possibly provides the opportunity for many jobs, um, and so certainly uh, 15 years ago when, we were, uh, when I was studying marine biology, 
we heard just about the idea of using iron to fertilize the ocean. That's probably not a great idea, and it's starting to be outlawed as a way of encouraging plankton blooms. Iron is a nutrient that's missing in many plankton communities. But certainly, the idea of bringing nutrient-rich water up from deep water up to the surface is something that's being considered. Also trying to control the climate a bit more. Putting mirrors in space, this has been costed. The idea of putting millions of mirrors into space to reflect away some of the sunlight, to control warming. Seeding clouds using saltwater mist, um, using reflective crops, painting mountains is even something that people have started to play around with. But of course, as things warm, things move around. I mentioned the idea of, of fish moving polewards in the northern hemisphere. So that then gets people thinking about, well, should we start moving species around? Can we build artificial reefs in the Mediterranean, for example, where coral reefs may in 20 years' time have the ideal conditions. Should we really be thinking about moving species around? And that's the species that currently exist. Of course, genetic modification, particularly in terms of aquaculture, is something that is being considered. Um, and some of those uh, ideas with genetic modification, probably not all, all dumb, particularly the idea of turning any uh, farmed product sterile so that it can't escape into the, into the wild populations. That's not necessarily a dumb idea. And then, of course, we can build our way out of some of the problems. If we've, got, if we've got sea level rise, well, we build bigger walls. We build a wall that would protect Bangladesh, or we build a, a series of dikes to protect Manhattan. Is that something that we can realistically consider? So just in closing, a lot of what I've talked about is global, or it's elsewhere, it's Bangladesh, or it's the Southern Ocean. So you might think, well, what does that really mean to me here in Bristol today? One of my Australian colleagues put it fantastically when he said, probably provocatively, every time you start a car, you kill a fish. Now, hopefully, for those of you who have driven, that's not a literal interpretation of the ocean acidification um, uh, work on fish behavior, but it shows the connection between every one of us with the ocean. So if people say to me, what can I do? The first thing I say is not, not only keep your feet off the ground sometimes, but keep them in the sea occasionally. Go to the, go to the seaside, dip your feet in the ocean, reconnect with that world that's both exhilarating, stunning, and exciting. Buy sustainable fish. It's not rocket science to do that. Think further down the food chain. Look at places like the Marine Conservation Society for ideas. You can get a little credit card that, um, uh, a document to go in your wallet that gives you an idea of all the good fish that you should be buying when you're out for dinner or you're in the supermarket. Talk to your fishmongers. Give them the impression that you want to make decisions that are informed. But most importantly, I think, is to consider our children. Education is going to be the key. I heard recently someone say, perhaps for our watch, we've, we've, we've not got enough time to get it right. So it's not about the planet we leave our children, it's about the children we leave our planet. We need children that really are thinking in the right ways. But I gave this talk, not a, sim a similar talk, at the tobacco factory two years ago, and someone at the end put their hand up and said, hang on a minute, you've been talking about future generations. What have future generations ever done for me? And you might, I mean, I was a little bit knocked back by that, but it turns out that that's what a lot of people think. There's a disconnect between us and those without a voice, which kind of le leads us to a, a situation of intergenerational imperialism. Is that something that we're really happy with? But I'd say in closing, we're lucky. We've got a globally connected world. We've got a lot of good science. We've got the information we need to be able to try and make good decisions. So I would suggest that it's not too late. If we really work hard, communicate, think, do, do make sensible decisions, there is still a very prosperous future for the world's oceans. Thank you.